Since graduating from the Slade School of Art in 2009, artist filmmaker Ed Atkins has been busy. He was selected for New Contemporaries and shortlisted for the Jarman Award. He has co-curated at the ICA, been commissioned by Freeze Film and Channel 4, and had a solo show at Tate Britain. We spoke to him about his current exhibition at the Serpentine Sackler Gallery. So, X. Tell us something about where the current exhibition at Serpentine Sackler Gallery came from. Yeah. It doesn't actually have a name, does it, this show? The show doesn't, no, but there's the, the, the main piece in it is called Ribbons, which is this uh, three-channel uh, video work. Um, in, in the Serpentine, it's, it's, a, it's kind of expanded, so there's a fourth channel, and it's a larger work now. The fourth channel is individually called Bastard. Um, where it came from, a lot of this stuff was me... So I made a piece of work um, last year for the Lyon Biennial called Even Pricks, which was kind of partially in response to uh, ideas or problems of kind of trolling online in a way, or what it was to be to be kind of misanthropic and maybe a bit monstrous in an online social context. And the fact that a lot of the kind of more, um, the larger kind of social networking things don't really afford antagonism or, or negativity. You know, like just the, the Facebook thing of not really having a thumbs down option. You can only ever agree or shut up in a way. You know, you can, you can say, you can write things, but the convenience is always with the affirmative. Um, and that, that kind of permeates in certain ways about consensus, about agreement, about this tacit idea that we should all be in agreement. And uh, for a long time I've been writing quite sort of um, angry stuff or desperate stuff, the writing and the performances in the work. But this was a way of kind of consolidating it and, and thinking about it in a slightly broader social context. So even Pricks features this, this thumb uh, rotating and sort of morphing in various ways and deflating and inflating. All of these things trying to sort of sit together as, as a metaphoric possibility within the work. And Ribbons was kind of continuing thinking about um, certain kinds of ways of feeling that were particularly symptomatic of living a life in, on, online in a way. Or, or, you know, so there's a guy called Biffo Baradi who wrote, uh, writes very well about um, one of the symptoms of immaterial labour being alienation, depression, um, a kind of uh, detachment, um, which I've, I guess maybe we can all identify with as spending hours at computers and things, but particularly that kind of way of vicarious living. Um, so the figure in Ribbons, who's often sort of skulking under a table or behind a wall, or is, is a kind of desperate figure who's kind of pathetic and very, um, very sort of um, needy, horrible thing really and a drunk as well um, so I kind of you know this thing was a kind of a, a, a way to understand a lot of those things uh, in that kind of online in that way of just not really being allowed being made monstrous by being antagonistic um, or, or being desperate but it was also a piece that uh, increasingly using a lot of this technology and using a lot of the the imagery in that thing is a feeling that this is the imagery and the, and the movement and the rhythm of a very particular moment in late capitalist uh, aesthetics, in a way. It's the aesthetics of, of capitalism. <coughs> and there was a way of thinking, sort of almost thinking that ribbons would be like this almost toxic performance of those kinds of aesthetics. And obviously the, the protagonist, the protagonist of capitalism is a, is a white Western man. You know, that, that, that's the figure we know is the site of power. So this figure had to be this thing. Uh, obviously, I'm that as well. So there's a lot of uh, convening of kind of uh, difficult ways of understanding your, yourself through these models, uh, models literally, but also figuratively. Yeah. Is the avatar based on you in any way? Well, it's uh, not. Uh, so the, the the way that they're made is this performance capture thing. So I'll sit in front of the laptop with a Kinect camera, I think there's one. Actually, it's not a Kinect, it's this, this prime sense thing, but it's a motion capture thing, so I, I, I'll um, uh, perform in front of it and it will record the 3D map of my face and then that, that gets put onto... So, and then, so for the recent one, for Ribbons, um, 
uh, he's gone onto this this particular model who's called Dave. You can buy him. You know, he's he's quite expensive, but he's like an off the shelf thing, which I've then done all this sort of doodling on his on his skin and stuff, these reminders and these little horrible things. Um, I mean, so much of it is actually flat planes. A lot of it is building up of of images um, in After Effects and in Premiere. You know, so really the final image that you end up with is, is so far removed from its constitutive elements. So the, the animation stuff or the CG stuff is just one layer. And then uh, pushing and pulling between depths of field, so there's also sort of dust on the fake lens and there's uh, uh, lens flares and then there's a background and then in front of that there's probably some shadows and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, you end up with a sort of, on the timelines of these things, like a, 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 a cake and then rendering that out. Yeah. But usually it's uh, from top to bottom, it's like uh, uh, writing and, and, and sort of pulling in lots of citation, sort of things that I'm kind of hanging on to in terms of phrase and images and stuff. I guess this is kind of normal. And then you're putting them together in folders and things. And then drawing out very roughly, like how a scene might sort of look. Yeah, I've never, I've always tried to keep notebooks and real things, you know, but it's never really worked out. I tend to kind of plunge straight in because you can, Occasionally, I mean, so when I'm communicating with the guy that, that, that helps with all the animation stuff, uh, I have to draw out stuff for him. So there's these kind of slightly shitty storyboards that, that, um, um, that happen. I mean, this is for a new piece that, that's being made, but, but they're kind of, they're, they're just expedient ways of communicating something um, rather than anything in and of themselves. Um, Writing similarly, I, I kind of, I think I get a sort of wrist strain when I try and write with my like handwriting now. Like everything is straight away typed. Actually, I've been doing these drawings on the iPad just to see what that's like. <laughs> that's been kind of, in fact, yes, actually. So all of the drawings and the doodles all over his body would a vectors done on the on the iPad. So they're kind of, you know, nothing eludes the 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 process of digitization really in the work I guess yeah yeah so it is I mean it's technically my movements my face my voice but he is much more um, importantly kind of generic mm -hmm. but generic according to what you know the presumption of, of a kind of every person obviously he's kind of a buff horrible thing um, yeah so it, it is me but it, it's also like the work necessarily has a lot of biographical flavour to it, but it's not, it's nothing, nowhere near as sort of straightforward as being autobiographical sure. in some way. I guess, Do you yeah. think he's an accurate representation of 21st century youth as a...? No, not, I mean, yeah, I mean, I would never presume to know what that was. <laughs> and he's too, I mean, I, I hope not in a way, because he's, he's kind of, he's desperate and horrified and, and horrible. Um, but that I, that there are definitely things in there that I kind of want to be able to speak of for not for anyone, but as myself and my own res responses to these things, um, and a lot of masochistic, guilty behaviour, a lot of a kind of attempt almost to get past guilt without naming it as such in a way. So there's a lot of responsibility that I feel in the making of the work, which isn't necessarily there in, in people's apprehension of it, I suppose. You know. It's also quite an empty character, if that's not an no, yeah. in terms. Uh, uh, do you think his acts of drinking and smoking are and shouting as yeah. well, or perhaps attempts to fill this void. Yeah, I mean, I've never, I've never really thought of him as, as a character. You know, he's not fleshed out as a. He doesn't have a story. He doesn't have any narrative, really, possibility outside of the, the situations he's in. He's much more of a cipher, really, for, for a desire or an incoherent kind of, you know, the the, the need to speak to exist, but the not knowing what to say and how to say it. Um, yeah, and the same with the same with the, the drinking. You know, he's sort of he's operating in such a hysterical extreme. You know, both the explicitness of his rendering. You know, he's so kind of present and, and hyper real in certain ways, but also the the drinking, the singing. These are all excessive kinds of behaviour. The singing is is kind of sentimental in ways that it's kind of mawkish and a bit like a musical. But it's also and then the shouting, the constant swearing. Yeah, he's 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 a hysteric, totally. You know, yeah. And you've mentioned the words pathetic and horrible. And yeah. I was going to ask whether we ought to be feeling sympathy with him, empathy 
for him? I think a bit of everything, really. You know, like I think, I mean, he's so, and I think the work generally, generally uh, demands empathy very aggressively, mm. um, and in a way that I think some of the things that, it, that the work does for me, I kind of hope to be, for it to be quite. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's very needy work, but I think it's it's also important that that people don't like him. That or it's not important that, but that they understand that he's a, a brute and he's a kind of a symbol of uh, violence and brutality in a way, in self-inflicted and then externally. So you know, so he's part of a historical thing, and, and the, the the fact that the songs are this kind of history of. Um, sort of male wallowing in songs, you know, like the, the Purcell round, which is a drinking song for men in a pub about women and madness and love, um, is part of the same lineage that with the Randy Newman song about love and depression and, you know, melancholy. And the, even Obama Dich, which is, you know, like, is, is this sort of strange plea of someone who's guilty, you know. Mm. And guilty of what? I think the, uh, the ambiguity of guilt and the locus of guilt for in the work is important for me to not be resolved but it, but to be performed in a way. So is it pathos or bathos or both? Oh, it's both, definitely. I mean, I think the the bathetic thing, actually it was only through talking with Mike Sperlinger who, who wrote an essay in the, in the book that accompanies the show uh, about bathos in my writing. That, I, that, that stuff really started to appear as kind of one of the fundaments of the work. So even in the edit, in the rhythm, there's a lot of plunging between poles, a lot of kind of uh, almost sort of s movements towards the sublime and towards a kind of romanticism and a uh, beauty, beauty or something and intoxication only to be sort of cut and foreshortened in, a, in an instant, you know, or with a fart or with a burp or something. You know, there's kind of also the D2 messing of things, so the head deflating, the kind of flaccid cock and all of these things that are very... Um, the lowliest of the low in a way in terms of kind of uh, literally like gravitationally but also as a kind of the failure of something or, or something kind of being retarded by its own excessive hubris or something you know. I was going to ask about the interruptions actually are, yeah. are they carefully orchestrated? Uh, they, they become that they're often much more sort of you know what it is to to read as you write in a way, um, is you know when to drop in a comma or a full stop, or you know when to not do it and that that will become a, uh, a deliberate kind of destructive or an interruptive thing. So it doesn't, so often, oftentimes I, I, I feel like the work is predicated upon people's general fluency in, in moving image, TV, cinema, video games, whatever. People know how to read them, uh, genre, they know how to read some generic things and they know how to feel when a piece of music in a certain key is played over an image. People know how to feel. But I think that fluency affords such a great kind of tension when you do break it, when you interrupt it, or you say, oh, fuck that, you know, or you sweep it away. So um, they're often kind of in response to reading the thing and, and while I'm making it, but then going back and sort of playing with that edit so that it's it's exactly the right way of interrupting something, you know, yeah. And how and at what stage did you add the text in to the film? Uh, f from the beginning, from the beginning, um, yeah. I mean, uh, there's a, there's a there's a longer text that exists uh, where all of the the text is sort of sourced from. Um, uh, it's often a, it's a matter of just snipping it right down. And also, often kind of decohering it at various points is like uh, increasingly not really wanting anyone to finish being able to say anything, you know. So he's often sort of caught midway through the protagonist in the in the video is often sort of caught midway through t trying to explain something or sort of delving too deep into some sort of theoretical lexicon, you know, some pathetic sort of uh, rambling in a way. Um, but then at the same time, he, he's often disappointed by that, so starts swearing at you or something, you know, or having another drink. Because you know. <laughs> for a long time I've been trying, trying to sort of have text sit well within video, but not as a, not as a addendum in a way, in the same way that, you know, like, so subtitles are not really 
uh, understood as part of the film, they're kind of added. But I always wanted text and language to be uh, implicit. Because I think there's a, lot, there's a pervasiveness of um, you know, technology re-mystifying our relationship to matter and to other bodies. You know, so not really ever thinking about the, the bodies that are traumatized in a mine somewhere when they're, they're digging up the minerals that go into this or whatever. You know, that obviously, the, the more the design becomes uh, beautiful, becomes opaque to us, we, the more we, we start using words like immaterial when we talk about the digital milieu, um, when actually, yeah, the cloud is a kind of met is a figurative turn of phrase which actually refers to places in the desert which are sort of hulking masses of servers and things. You know, there's there's nothing dematerialized about that at all. It's just that it's deferred. And the film has been described as part musical, part horror, and part melodrama. Mm. Do you think that's accurate? I think that's, those things are all in there. Mm. I would hope there's a lot more in there as well. But I think in terms of it's, I always kind of get excited by the possibility of things being described categorically, you know, necessarily having to have recourse to saying what something is. And I think a big part of the work is, is a kind of belief in not having to say that. And how that's difficult in our, in our culture and society is to, to allow things to not be determined is difficult to hold on to. But I think it's important because I think actually determining things and categorizing things is a kind of violence really often, you know, it's a compromising of something.